A lot of emphasis is placed on the proper selection of fans and the amount of energy fans consume. System design and the fan system interface can have a dramatic effect on fan energy consumption. In this video, we will look at the effect duct design has on fan operation through differences in pressure loss. We will also touch on the subject of system effect as it relates to the fan system interface. To illustrate, we are utilizing a single wide, single inlet light duty blower, often referred to as a utility set or vent set. The fan has a non-ducted inlet and length of duct connected to the discharge, a common setup in fan testing. Our duct is the same size as the fan discharge and is 48 inches long. How important is the length of the discharge duct? Let's take a closer look. AMCA, the Air Movement and Control Association, establishes test standards for fans and a certified rating program that ensures uniformity in fan testing. AMCA Standard 201 shows why discharge duct length is important. This diagram, taken from AMCA 201, shows the velocity profile at the discharge of a typical blower. You can see that as the air immediately leaves the blower, the velocity of the air in the duct varies widely. And as the air travels along the duct, it evens out. The velocity profile at the end of the duct is known as a fully developed flow and provides the opportunity for the lowest pressure loss as the duct system changes directions. Let's look at the performance of our fan with the discharge duct attached. We can see that the fan is moving approximately 1500 CFM and that there is no measurable static pressure associated with the straight discharge duct. We will use this as our benchmark as we compare the effect of different duct fittings on fan performance. It should be noted that the duct velocity is roughly 1800 feet per minute. With higher velocities, the effects we are studying will be more dramatic. We will be referring to elbow fitting using common terminology. The heel is the outer face of the elbow as it turns. The throat is the inner face of the elbow. Finally, the cheek of an elbow is one of the sides connecting the heel and throat. Now we'll place a fitting on the end of the duct. We're attaching a 90 degree square elbow to the discharge of the duct. And you can see that our pressure drop for this fitting is around 3 tenths of an inch. Adding one fitting on the system has reduced the airflow by 10%. How can one fitting have such a dramatic effect on the fan performance? To illustrate, we'll take a closer look at what's going on inside the fitting. First, we'll use a tissue to help visualize the airflow exiting the fitting. At first, the tissue acts as we would expect, blowing upward. But as we move to the throat of the elbow, we see it being pulled into the fitting, not what we expected. To visualize the airflow within the fitting, we will inject bubbles into the airstream. You can see the air flowing through the middle of the fitting as we would expect but two eddies or areas of recirculation are being formed. One in the far corner or heel of the elbow and one just after the throat. These eddies create inefficiency and unnecessary pressure loss, wasting fan energy. Let's take a minute to evaluate the ramifications. If we encountered this in the field and needed 1500 CFM and are only getting 1340 CFM, we would need to speed the fan up to get the required airflow. Our demo fan is running 1574 RPM and consuming 0.25 brake horsepower. Using the fan laws, we calculate that the fan would need to run 1762 RPM with a new brake horsepower of 0.35 to get the required airflow. Unfortunately, in this case, the motor on our demo fan is a quarter horse motor and would need to be replaced with a larger motor to get the required performance. You can see the problems that can arise when the system pressure is not fully accounted for. Moving on, let's replace this fitting with another. The second fitting is dimensionally identical to the first, but turning vanes have been added. This type of turning vane is known as a single thickness turning vane. By adding the turning vanes, you can see that we have reduced the pressure drop to 0.08, a reduction in pressure loss of 75%. Looking at our flow visualization, the airflow through the fitting is much more uniform with less turbulence, resulting in a lower pressure loss and greater airflow. The first cost of this fitting is roughly $15 more than the elbow without vanes, but the energy savings goes on for the operating life of the system. 
Here, we can see that the additional cost of the veins are worth the added expense, with a payback of less than two years. The next fitting we will evaluate is called a short radius elbow. A short radius elbow has a centerline radius approximately equal to the duct dimension in the same plane. Our duct is 9 inches by 13 inches, so the centerline radius of this elbow is also 13 inches. As you can see, the pressure drop is very low, with an airflow just 30 CFM short of our baseline setup. We see very little turbulence in the fitting, reinforcing the result. Short radius elbows are compact, yet have minimal pressure loss. This elbow is also less costly than a square elbow with turning veins. In this case, 22% less expensive. The third fitting is a short radius elbow with a square 90 degree throat. It takes up the same space as the short radius elbow, but is cheaper to make. When comparing the two fittings, we can see that the square throat reduces the cross-sectional area at the middle of the fitting by nearly 20% and creates an abrupt transition that the air has to navigate. As we can see from the flow visualization, the air gets squeezed down through the throat and moves along the heel of the elbow with the air just downstream of the throat recirculating. This contraction and turbulence results in five times the pressure loss when compared to the short radius elbow, with an airflow reduction of 135 CFM, or 9%. The next fitting is a short radius elbow with a mitered throat. The reduction in cross-sectional area is just under 6% when compared with the true short radius elbow. This minor reduction does still create a small eddy just after the throat with otherwise smooth flow. The flow is much better than the radius elbow with square throat, and only 30 CFM less than the short radius elbow. Now we move on to a fitting that we have all been told is the ideal from a performance standpoint, the long radius elbow. As we can see, the throat of the elbow is smooth, and the arc of the throat is a much larger radius than the short radius elbow. Visualizing the flow, we see a very smooth flow throughout the fitting. Not surprisingly, the pressure loss for this fitting is virtually zero. So why not use a long radius elbow everywhere? Sometimes there is simply not enough space. This fitting takes up to 68% more real estate than the other elbows we have seen. It also costs somewhat more. From an energy use standard, it is the ideal, but the space required may be prohibitive. What if you don't have the space for a long radius elbow, but like the performance? Take a short radius elbow and put a splitter at a third the width of the duct from the throat. Looking closely at the geometry, we now essentially have two long radius elbows. The performance is nearly as good as the large radius elbow, taking up much less space. Having thoroughly explored elbow fittings, let's take a look at what are commonly known as T fittings. Our first fitting is often referred to as a bullhead T. Each downstream branch is sized to handle half of the airflow entering the fitting. Many of us have been told to avoid the bullhead T at all costs. The data shows this may not always be true. The pressure loss of the fitting is not terrible. Looking closer, we find that a small dam of air formed where the airflow splits, guiding the air to each branch. As we saw with the square elbow before, we are getting turbulence after the turn, contributing to the loss. Next, we have taken the bullhead T and mitered the throat of the fitting. This opens up the throat area, providing more room for a smooth flow in each direction and minimizing the turbulence downstream. The pressure drop is similar to the square elbow with turning veins or short radius elbow. A common fitting in duct systems is a high efficiency takeoff. This is often used to attach a round flex duct to a rectangular duct. The pressure loss of the fitting itself is seen to be a 0.15. When we add a typical five foot length of flex duct, however, the pressure loss increases to 0 0.30, double the loss of the fitting alone. We can see that the flex is straight, which is rarely the case. Flex duct is generally used to make it easy to connect to a diffuser. In the most severe case, this could mean a 180 degree bend. As you can see, the pressure loss may increase dramatically. Here we see a surprising 0.6. This demonstrates the importance of properly applying flex duct, keeping lengths as short as possible, velocities low, and bends gradual. 
this table of fitting is shown as a template for you to make your own comparisons. Cost of fabrication and electricity can vary from location to location. Summarizing, we have demonstrated the varying effect that different types of fittings can have on fan and system performance. Fitting selection should not be left to chance. The selection of fittings should balance first cost against pressure loss and physical space constraints. In part two of this series, we'll be looking at the inlet side of the fan and how different duct configurations affect fan performance. We will also demonstrate system effect and its associated consequences. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. If you have suggestions about any subjects you would like to see covered, send them to marketing at laurencook.com.